US empire usually functions via plausible deniability. Either denying the overthrow of a democratic government is in fact a coup by, for example, painting military rule as just temporary transition period to restore constitutional order. Or if a coup can't be denied, if you can't say, no, that was legitimate, just say it wasn't anything to do with us. We just happened to be uh, in close contact with the people who did it. And we just happened to be you know, funding them and potentially providing military expertise. But ultimately, what they say is the, the United States doesn't stand up and say, yeah, we backed that coup. We, it was a coup, we backed it, and we're proud of the role we played. That's not what they do. But whilst government press releases are careful with their words, pot-smoking billionaires aren't necessarily so, especially not on Twitter. This was the case of Elon Musk on the weekend. So on Saturday, in response for calls for more government support for business and citizens during coronavirus, um, the Tesla owner tweeted, Another government stimulus package is not in the best interests of the people, IMO. A Twitter user replies, you know what wasn't in the best interest of people? The US government organizing a coup against Evo Morales in Bolivia so you could obtain the lithium there. We'll fill you in on the context there. What does Elon Musk reply? We will coup whoever we want. Deal with it. That's not the kind of thing you'll ever hear a press secretary from the US State Department say. It's not what you'll hear when a CIA director stands in front of Congress and has to justify what they have been doing over the past five years. This is the kind of stuff that you won't hear from official channels. But you know that Elon Musk is actually having you know, regular conversations with the president. So when he says, we will coup, coup whoever we want, deal with it, you maybe should take it seriously, right? Now, Musk fans have obviously claimed this was a joke. You know, it's just his sense of humor. Um, I can't read Elon Musk's mind. Maybe he did mean it as a joke. But what we do know is that there was a coup in Bolivia and it will benefit Elon Musk. Why is that the case? Well, we'll go into the details again about the coup in a moment. But why it is the case is because Bolivia is a leading supplier of lithium, which is necessary for the production of batteries. Those batteries are used in Tesla cars. Tesla now the most valuable car production company in the world. Surprising. Um, and um, the democratically elected president of Bolivia, well, ex-president, although the, the last democratically elected one, Evo Morales, was a social democrat, unwilling to let US corporations exploit the South American nation's natural resources. Um, let's take a look now. As I said, we're going to the details of the coup, why it was a coup, who supported the coup when they shouldn't have done. Um, but first of all, because we're directly talking about Elon Musk now, I want to go to a clip of Evo Morales speaking to The Intercept's Glenn Greenwald a month after his removal from power. Hemos exportado litio, pero de la planta pilote el próximo año vamos a inaugurar la planta de la industria de carbonato de litio. Entonces yo siento que que ese ese sector energético tan importante que desde Bolivia inclusive tenemos la oportunidad de poner el precio de litio para todo el mundo. Pero con participación, Europa, China, Asia, y esté fuera de Estados Unidos, eso no soporta. Que un indio maneje eso, y como Estado, además de eso. Entonces yo sigo convencido, este es un golpe de Estado al litio, pasando un golpe de Estado a Evo y a todas las políticas económicas. So that's Evo Morales speaking in December, so that was a month after he was forced out of power and forced into exile. Um, in fact, so he's talking about there how, you know, at the point when he was kicked out of power, Bolivia were expanding their lithium industry. Um, and he was saying they would have had a role, not just setting the price of lithium coming out of Bolivia, but the global price, because they were such a, or they would have been such a powerful producer. You could have seen something like OPEC, for example, where you've got different oil producing states who set a price. Now, that's exactly the kind of thing um, that the Western powers hate, because what they want to do is, I suppose, privatize it straight away, sell it for, you know, as cheap as possible to their corporations or take the profit themselves. They hate this kind of economic nationalism where a, a leader of a developing country or third world country, they found that unacceptable. Um, and Evan Morales says, says he's convinced this was a lithium coup. Then seven months later, you've got Elon Musk who runs Tesla. What do they require? Lithium for their batteries. He says, yeah, we'll coup whoever we want, deal with it. Um, that tweet didn't 
or wasn't ignored or was noticed, I suppose, by Evo Morales. Let's take a look at this. At Elon Musk, owner of the largest electric car factory, says about the coup in Bolivia, we will hit whoever we want. Another proof that the coup was due to Bolivian lithium and two massacres as a result. We will always defend our resources. The massacres referred to their uh, civilians who were shot in the protests um, which followed Morales or Morales is pushing from power, followed the coup. Um, Aaron, I know you've been following this story. Um, what do you make of this? How seriously should we take what Elon Musk said? Does it matter if he was joking or not, considering that it seems you know, that a coup did happen and it probably will benefit him? Well, it's very reminiscent of, of sort of 1950s Cold War, um, overt Cold War rhetoric. You know, you've got uh, the, the old adage, the United States doesn't have friends, it merely has interests. Uh, and Elon Musk was basically saying that, you know, he was saying it in a sort of very, ge you know, Gen X uh, ridiculing social media ties way, but he was effectively saying the same thing. Uh, you know, it's been about eight months now since the coup. The interim president, interim president, is still there. Uh, her party at that election got 4% of the vote. She's still there, 4%. Evo Morales, you know, the, the, the OAS, the Organization of American States, said, well, we, you know, he, he can't have, have won by the margin that he did because if you win by more than a certain amount in the first round, I believe it's 10%, then there is no second round effectively. Uh, because it was so close for so long, he was always in the lead. And, and the OAS, nobody's ever said he didn't come first uh, because he was only marginally in the lead. And then he sort of gets the necessary uh, difference uh, sort of in the final hurdle, uh, the final furlong rather, towards the end. Uh, they said, well, that can't be correct. Uh, so nobody's disputed that Avon Morales came first. And yet he has to leave the country. His family and friends and political allies are threatened with political violence. Uh, and you have a, a panoply of publications, The Economist, The New York Times, The Guardian, The Observer, uh, saying that he, he, you know, he, he should have left. He was, he was wrong to try and hold on to power. This is a country which for for centuries has been ruled over by a, a, effectively a European political class. He was an indigenous um, leader. And the reason why he won a democratic election, by the way, in 2019 as well, is because Bolivia is a majority indigenous uh, country. They make up the majority of the, the population. Uh, and so this story at any moment would be distasteful, unsavory. But coming in the context of, like you say, this coup, eight months later, the interim European uh, leader still being in charge uh, and very little very little contrition actually from the people that kind of that cheered it on at the time effectively nobody well very few i mean the only exception here is the new york times and a little bit sunny under has basically oh maybe i was wrong but apart from that nobody else has really done that mm. i mean let's go through some of these evidence right so so as i mean that was a very good explanation of, of what happened so ultimately yeah you had the organization of american states they say oh there were irregularities here the election gets cancelled morales gets overthrown replaced by someone as you say who got four percent of the vote the whole international media is saying oh yeah this is fine because it's an interim government the interim government are yeah. going to make way for proper democratic elections which aren't you know controlled and disrupted by this demagogue you've heard all of the language about latin american leaders before that that was the, the the narrative, including in the MIT and the Observer, as we're going to go to in a moment. Um, but then an independent study six months later finds that, oh, actually, it turns out the election was fine in the first place. And this isn't something that we just read on, you know, like a left wing blog. Um, this is a very reputable study, which has been, yes, reported in The New York Times. We can go to this now. A bitter election, accusations of frauds and now second thoughts, a closer look. At Bolivian election data suggests an analysis by the OAS, the Organization of American States, that raised questions of vote rigging and helped force out a pre president was flawed. You can go look up that article. It tells you in great detail how that was just a completely normal election. Uh, there should not have been concerns. It was just the fact that many of the... It, it seemed basically like there was a sudden surge in, in Morales' votes when it came to the count, but that was just because he's more popular in more remote districts because he, the, the rural poor back Morales. So it was a perfectly reasonable explanation no reason to void the election whatsoever um and as you say Aaron, the, the myt have now published this they're not you know they're not suppressing this information but at the time you know all the mainstream leader writers were backing it and it's all very well to say six months after oh yeah maybe they shouldn't have done the coup but it's a bit late now because the interim president is still in power and they're probably not going to give that up particularly 
easily, especially as if polls are correct, they'll lose. The, the only way to keep Morales and his power mass, his party mass out of power is to um, retain a dictatorship with military repression. Fundamentally, that's the only way you can rule if you don't have popular backing. Um, but yeah, Aaron, you mentioned the sort of people who backed it at the time. We would just, I would just want to get up some evidence of this um, and especially, you know, UK evidence. So this is The Observer, our liberal paper of choice. Um, let's look at their leader at the time. There is also the fraught possibility that Morales and his supporters will boycott new polls, dispute the winner's legitimacy and set up a rival administration as happened in Venezuela. Morales' claim that he was ousted by an old style military coup is not justified by the facts. Democracy is still working in Bolivia, just. Now he has a responsibility to ensure that remains the case and eschew any coup making of his own. If you read the whole article, they're like, oh, even Morales, yeah, he did do some economic policies, but ultimately he's got too powerful and he can only be blamed for his own downfall. And yeah, basically this is just people restoring democracy. He should now, it, the responsibility on is on him to now retain the peace and to make sure there is no constitutional disruption. Mm. Now, why have the observer there put, you know, the assumption, the assumption is, oh, if Morales had been over front, oh, it must be his fault, the left-wing leader, oh, what an idiot. Then you find out six months later, oh, actually, the election was completely fair. He was overthrown in a coup by a leader who has remained in power, a right-winger without any public support, and what was a vibrant democracy with basically a healthy social democracy has now become a dictatorship, right? You mentioned Sonny Hundor. Let's go to that as well. Um, and actually, this is a good point because this is showing that not only do the mainstream press just toe the line, I, I just don't think, I don't believe the Observer leader writers did any research into this. I think they looked at like The Economist and they thought, oh, we've got to take a balanced mm. take, which is like, oh, we've got nothing against progressive economic policies. I and mean, we do think poor people should be able to have some food vouchers. But if someone's been overthrown, we'll probably side with the Americans because, uh, you know, it's, it's just a... Pfft, Anyway, it's ridiculous. Anyway, this is Sunny Hundle calling out people who are calling out The Observer. So you've got Ash Sarkar again. I said her tweets come up a lot on this show. Um, so she's saying, what's happening is a fascist coup. It's de facto a war on women, the working class, and the indigenous people who voted for Morales. Solidarity with socialists under attack in Bolivia. Now, as we've seen, The Observer said this was legitimate. It wasn't a coup. Ash saying it was a coup. Who was history proven correct? Ash, what was Sunny Hundle saying at the time? The difference between Democrats and communists is the latter will ignore the trashing of democracy when it suits them. Now, who trashed democracy? It was not Morales. Do some independent research, okay? Um, he, as, as you say, he has admitted he was wrong. But again, six months later, it's a bit too late. But I want to go back actually to another exchange he had at the time because it brings up another person who always talks about conspiracy theories. This is Sonny Hundle. It's reassuring most of those calling events in Bolivia's in Bolivia a coup are usually the people to ignore on foreign policy anyway. And then David Aronovich says, yeah. you mean like yeah. the leader of the Labour Party and prospective prime minister? You know, so, so he's someone, he always puts himself forward as this expert on conspiracy theories. What he's an expert on is dismissing people who've looked at some evidence and decided that actually maybe the narrative, which was pumped out of the American State Department, isn't necessarily true. You know, these people have all been proved absolutely wrong. The costs, the outcomes are huge. You've got a country which was a healthy democracy with egalitarian policies, which is now a dictatorship. And these people at the time are like, oh, stupid left-wing people who don't believe the State Department, conspiracy theorists. It's, it's, it's astounding, isn't it? Well, yeah, going back to the Observer editorial, you know, it's still a democracy, just, no, it's literally no longer a democracy. This kind of Orwellian double speak. I mean, they've got in that passage, it's incredible. They've got absolutely every every clause and every subclause completely wrong. I mean, they couldn't have got the wording more wrong. You know, Morales is a dictator, authoritarian. Well, no, he wants to do a coup. No, he's literally trying to resist a coup. It's still a democracy. No, this is literally an act which subverts its status as a democracy. And like you say, all they've done is. They've got they've got the economists. They say, okay, let's basically say what the economist says, but we want corporation tax two percent higher. Let's say what the economist says, but you know we we will, we want to rally a little bit more against global tax avoidance. That's it. They haven't got an original contribution to make. They don't really have a political pole of attraction. They haven't for 20, 30 years. The Observer, by the way, the Observer and the Sunday Times used to do stunning investigative journalism. The, the Observer, it was the Observer which um, found in the early nineteen eighties that vetting 
of BBC staffers on political grounds was still going on and on an industrial scale. The, that was the kind of story the Observer did 30 years ago. And now we have, you know, the Observer just uh, from yesterday on Sunday, non-entity story, uh, and its editorials from late last year, just absurd, you know, obscene Orwellian doublespeak. Uh, and it tells you a great deal actually about that political tradition. And then with the Ronovich and Sonny Handel, we're well, in a way, Michael, they can afford to be wrong. They can afford to be wrong about everything because there's no overhead for them. They don't lose any respect amongst their fellow professionals. They don't lose the the the, the sort of the pundit gigs. David Ronovich will still be on BBC Radio 4, you know, waxing lyrical about how China is a threat to the, the Pax Americana. You know, I was listening to Radio 4 the other day and I hear uh, David Aronovich, you go, and literally the first three words were Russia, China, you know, coups. I was like, oh my, this is like, Pure, this is like, I, I feel like I'm watching a Clockwork Orange and people are about to sort of start syringing things into my eyes while I listen to David Aronovich talk about Russia, Russia and China on, on repeat. You know, the, the last people that should be taken seriously on foreign policy, I'm going to kind of, I'm going to uh, capsize the statement from Sonny Handel, are people like Sonny Handel and David Aronovich. But the point is, there's no overhead for them. You know, the more wrong they are, the better. The more that BBC Radio 4 will elevate them, the World Service will elevate them. Because the point is, all their job, their job is literally nothing more than to be utterly credulous with the State Department, be utterly credulous with the British security services, and poo-poo people like you, me, and Ash. That's their job. And if they just do that, they'll keep on getting the radio gigs. They'll keep on getting the kind of the pundit legitimacy. doesn't matter if they're wrong. doesn't matter if there's been an undemocratic coup. There's been the subversion of an entirely legitimate election result in Bolivia. doesn't matter if a hugely valuable mineral resource has been stolen effectively from the Bolivian people in the name of, you know, sort of American multinational business. That doesn't matter. And it's a huge, huge problem. It's a huge problem in political journalism, particularly pertaining to foreign policy, which is why, you know, you need to go to navarramedia.com forward slash support. Because because you know there's actually some really good work on this you know you've got declassified in the uk you've got navarra media i think the intercept is the outstanding sort of new media presence in the united states over the last five years on original investigative journalism there's clearly a number of great outlets you know in the uk we've also got tribune in the us you've got jacobin they're doing fantastic work and if, if they weren't doing that work if we weren't doing that work we're not the intercept yet uh, if we weren't doing that work, if Jacobin tribute, if you don't, if we don't do that work, nobody is. You know, Aronovich and Sonny Handel are unchallenged, uh, and so you know we we need to we need to build that counter media ecology because thirty years ago, papers like the Observer weren't doing this. Papers like the Observer were breaking the story that oh wow, the OAS is actually a bit of an American front. The OAS basically says what the State Department, you know, wants it to say. They're not doing that anymore. Sort of centrist, progressive mainstream journalism is failing and what historically it's been quite good at uh, and so that's that's the space we now need to fill i agree um there's one there's one thing i want to finish on which is i suppose to highlight to you i mean you might know more about bolivia than me i don't know i'm, I'm presumptuous here but if you don't it wasn't a particularly radical government i mean it was radical historically in terms of what has been permitted in latin america but it was a, fundamentally a social democracy right the, the kind of thing i back here um and to sort of show this, I want to get uh, an article from the Washington Post. And as we've said before, Washington Post did not have any critical coverage of the coup. You know, they're the, they, they took the State Department line. But before the election, earlier in the year, they were writing quite positively about Evo Morales' record in, in government. Um, so this is a quote from early last year in the Washington Post by one of their Latin American correspondents. 13 years after his movement for socialism won at the ballot box, it's indisputable that Bolivians are healthier, wealthier, better educated, living longer and more equal than at any time in this South American nation's history. As Morales seeks a fourth term in election Sunday, election Sunday, his Bolivia is serving as a counterpoint to Venezuela in the hemispheric debate over socialism, a now loaded word that has become a flashpoint in the US presidential race. The state will not be able to solve all problems, Morales told the Washington Post. The state, as the head of investment, accompanied by the private sector, that is the model of socialism we have. And the reason I wanted to point this out is because, you know, often what you hear in you know, liberal circles in this country is, you know, like, oh, Cuba, they've, you know, terrible, they don't respect human rights. Why would anyone on the left value what they've done? Why can't all countries in the global south just be a bit like Sweden? You know, obviously, social democracies which respect your liberal rights and have some sort of egalitarian redistribution, that's, you know, the best place to live. That's where rights are respected. I think that the Swedish model is probably the best model that's existed in, in modern history. But 
social democracy where liberal rights are respected and you have some egalitarian redistribution and international corporations are not allowed to just completely pillage your country. That's not allowed. That's what Morales was trying to do. What everyone says about, um, well, not Chavez anymore, Maduro, is that, oh yeah, the redistribution policies were okay, but why didn't he respect liberal institutions? Now, next door in Bolivia, you had Evan Morales, who was doing the redistribution. He was respecting the, the liberal institutions, and he still got overthrown. And still, when he got overthrown, you backed it because you couldn't be bothered to check the State Department's press release, right? So if you were going to castigate countries like Cuba for not having a vibrant liberal democracy, and I would prefer Cuba to have a vibrant liberal democracy, what you have got to do is take seriously the fact that where people have tried to have a vibrant liberal democracy and egalitarian social policies, it hasn't been allowed. They've been overthrown.